All right, we are back in Secret Weeb Room. I'm so excited. I want to read about my Irish lass, Marianne McCullough. July 14th, Cancer, 30 years old. 5 foot 11, jealous. Uh, interior designer, former architect. Nationality is Irish, represent. Religion, Roman Catholic. Education, Bachelor of Arts in Architecture. Likes chocolate cats, classical arts, country music, karaoke, board games, video games, anime, and other obscure pop culture items. <laughs> ah yes, anime, the very obscure pop culture item. Yes. And yoga. For health. I think I'm gonna get along well with you. Video games. Man, I never would have pegged her for the type, but it shows how much I know. Left in a dumpster as a- b wait, hold on. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> We've only just begun here. Left in a dumpster as a baby. She was found by a peddler and spent most of her childhood roaming the countryside in a beat-up van. Her father taught her how to read, write, and pray. Through an unconventional life, it was all sh Though an unconventional life, it was all she knew. Child welfare and protection eventually caught on and required that she have a proper education. She was provided a scholarship at St. Sampton's School for Young Ladies and was bullied for being a charity kid. Marianne only had one friend and was mostly focused on her studies, intent on graduating and returning to her father. A shame that he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's soon after. <sighs> Man. Her work as an architect in Ireland lasted until the Irish economic crisis. She moved to England, and after some time, Luxburn in search of better career opportunities. Wow. And there's her kitty. Bruthio. She was a dumpster baby. My goodness. Oh, and, actually, where are we at? We are the closest with Isabella. <laughs> I forgot about that. Pretty good terms with Hannah. Hannah. Nothing with Zachary, nothing with Rebecca, nothing with Ashton. And she actually, has, she actually had a better starting point with Luke than Hannah. Okay. Well, here we go. 7.15 p.m. The numbers are so little on the top of my screen, and they glare at me with such intensity that I can just hear their accusations. I'm late for a night out with the girls, yes, but I have a perfectly good excuse. Jeez. Considering I didn't follow typical office hours, they really can't expect me to be able to just go as I please at 5.30 on the dot. The client is, first and foremost, my priority. I have to sit tight when my personal assistant, Chris, tells me we have a big one coming up and that I shouldn't miss this one. He knows a lot more on the who's who and the what's what when it comes to these socialities, and I trust that judgment call. Socialites. Did I say socialities? <laughs> Ah yes, the socialities. <laughs> Socialites. Sorry, I really shouldn't have been thinking. I was trying to remember what date it was to, to orient myself in the time stream that we're in and wasn't paying attention to what I was reading. So I can't multitask apparently. I really don't have time for rich people, their drama and their politics. I'd rather watch anime and play video games. These sort who were born with silver spoons in their mouths and who were used to wagging their silver tongues about. I let him handle the negotiating with them for the most part. Why else would I, would I have hired him? Dang. But he told me I'd receive a message about it an hour ago. Also, what is on your computer screen? Oh my gosh, is that a vampire boy in a coffin? What is What is going on there? Is that a game? Quantum? Quantum something. I can't read what the bottom thing says. Huh. Now, if only he has the full shilling when it comes to the time. Hmm. Come on. I have a social life too, you know. To an extent. Sort of. Pressing my head against the table, I try to stave off an oncoming headache when the notification for a new email pops up. All I'm expecting is a, hey, this looks like a good project I found. Go send them a design, or something like that, really. That's how it often goes. 
Even with these rich, jammy clients who's heard of me from their equally rich, jammy friends, I can't expect them to hire me right off the bat. Which is all well and good and reasonable. We figure out what they want, send them my portfolio, my drafts for their projects, my rates, and hope for the best. Uh, from Chris Oak Parker, forward important client. Please read. Uh, okay. This is a big client, Marianne. I'll babysit Baruciel for you. <laughs> Just please take this one project. I promise this person is huge in Luxburn. Oh, from Johans. Uh, regarding Hannah W. Ermengarde Mansion. Mr. Parker, this is a formal request to secure the services of Marianne McCullough, here and after called the designer. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Johans. I'm, I'm glad that you uh, couldn't be bothered to type her name out every time. As authorized by Hannah Wright, here and after called the client. Okay, well, if you're doing that to your employer, fine. For interior design work at Ermengarde Mansion, Luxburn, LX18 ORF, United Kingdom. The client hopes to have the designer there on 21 October, Friday, with the time pending. Uh, but as I open the mail and see that I've been requested by the client specifically? Oh, that's neat. There's actually uh, attachments of the outside of the mansion and the inside of the rooms and stuff. That's pretty cool. Well, I certainly didn't expect that. And it's pretty straightforward, too. Anyone else would probably be excited. They would be working with THE Hannah Wright. She's just one of those rich socialites. Nailed it. That everybody loves to talk about, no matter how hard I try to tune such nonsense out. It would have been enough for me to reply an affirmative to Chris and leave, but he has never pleaded for me to take a project before. We've worked with big personalities in the past. Celebrities, bankers, and even a few politicians. My PA had been indifferent about those. So the question bounced about my skull before I spy one of the email attachments. Ah, Wright Enterprise donates two and a half million pounds to Refugee UK. To Refuge UK. A newspaper clipping from the Luxburn Daily's business news section boasting the headline, Wright Enterprise donates two and a half million to Refuge. Okay, I want to read this, actually. At the grand opening of a new Wright Hotel last Wednesday, our local billionaire couple, Luke and Hannah Wright, announced the donation of two and a half million pounds to help Luxburn Refuge keep their services open. Unexpected, but certainly welcome. This follows only a month after the couple's previous donation of the same amount to Save the Children UK. One of the largest donations, this amount will help keep the safe house in Luxburn open for several years. With this money, Refuge can keep helping women, children, and victims of domestic violence. There are rumors as well of the charity talking with the couple and looking into building a local center equivalent to their Gaia and Athena locations. These rumors have come to us due to one of the enterprise's employees mentioning a project EOS. I think that's how you say that. It certainly caused quite a stir back then. Apparently, they had invited businessmen and socialites everywhere, in the guise of it being some big business announcement. Two and a half mil and an expensive looking party to boot. These people sure know how to throw their money around. Now they want to throw it at you. Not that I should be so callous. They're going to do a lot of good and help a community of people with all those pounds. I, of all people, shouldn't criticize such acts whether they were for show or not, being as I was a dumpster baby. At the very least, I know they'll be able to pay my rates. With the headline out of the way, however, I find myself staring at the picture that came along with the clipping. Because... Wow. Only one of them has eyes. Here I am, expecting a sour old woman in a blazer and skirt. But the woman that was plastered on the front page looked like she belongs on the front page of the entertainment section, or even, if I am to be crass, as the pinup for a glamour. Okay, I'll be real here. A men's magazine. She sure knows how to rock that dress. <laughs> Many dots. Wait. Her hair, her eyes, her lips. She can't be her. Who's her? And at the same time, she is her, only several years older. She looks just like... 
No, come on, Mac. The world is full of pretty blondes. An old lover, mayhaps? It's just a coincidence. But... With a shake of my head, I snap out of it and reach out for my phone when it buzzes, nearly falling off my chair in the process. Who else would be on the other line but the very people waiting for me? Oh, piss. I'm so sorry, Calm. I'm on my way. That's what I say. Yet I still don't move from my chair, face flushed and heart racing. Okay, I'm gonna read this now that the phone is not booping. Okay. That was our first time on the 18th. An email from the Wrights came, requesting Marianne McCullough's expertise for their home. What seemed like an innocent commission made a different impact on the famous designer after seeing a picture of the Wright misses. Okay. I could only stare until I can will myself to reply that, yes, I'm accepting the assignment. And it takes even more time for me to just close the image, shut down the computer, and leave. Even then, it has already burned its image into my head no matter how much I wish it would just disappear. It makes me eager for the alcohol and the company. It makes me eager for anything that can help me forget. It's a good thing that the nearest pub is just a hop, skip, and a jump from here. Oh, the bar. Okay. The Galway Shawl, as it is called by those who frequented the place, is the only decent Irish pub in this county. You can pretty much tell that someone is new if they call it by its official name, The Crawl Bar. My home away from home ever since I've moved to Luxburn. Well, that is when I'm not cooped up in my condo and working anyway. It has good alcohol, good company, and thank God in St. Cecilia, good music. St. Cecilia, <laughs> good music. I just can't read today. Crowd favorites like the Bothy Noise, the High Wesley Men, and Second Fusion Orchestra are often played. Interesting titles. Not to mention the singing. I love singing. Anyone could just break out into a drinking song, and the others in the pub were just wonderful that they'd start singing along. And doing so while intoxicated is the best of ways to go about it. Hey, it's a win-win, as long as I don't puke in the middle of the chorus, and as long as I can get home in one piece at the end of the day. And tonight is karaoke night. What better time than to try and sing all my worries away? That's what my intoxicated brain tells me. The ghost of guilt and sorrow remembers who I am, and in the prison of my heart. I was my only slave. Holy cow, you've got some pipes. Sing for me more, please. Oh no, come on, sing more. I want to listen to more. But drinking only reminds me of my home. And the thought of home makes me think of her. But in the depths of my cold soul, I'll leave the burden and despair. No wonder you're singing such a sad song. It makes me nauseous. It sickens me that the smallest reminder of her can cause me such grief. I'll fight for what's worth fighting for. Forget the fear, forget the rest. Dang. Man. Of course, that might just be the booze. Any other day, I would have scolded myself for drinking so much. I lied to the Lord. I lied to myself. I lied to you and everyone I care. Until there were no more lies to tell. But I already have a client, and we'll be having our first little meet and greet in a few days. Cowardice is easier than being brave. But at last I found the strength I lost to sing my love letter to you. Cause people can lie, but my lone heart beats true. Is that the opening song for this game? I'm like, this sounds familiar, but where do I know it from? That last way she sang, like, that last line. Like, is that the opening to this game? Man, does it... She sang it so well. I want to at least enjoy this night, get over the hangover tomorrow, and return to being a prim and proper professional after. That song was for Woo! Cal, our lucky bride to be. So give her a hand, Galway Shawl. 
And give you a hand too, girl. Jeez. Yeah, there it is. There's a lot more people in this uh, pub than I was expecting. <laughs> Considering the state I'm in, one can excuse my smug grin as cheers and applause rise among the pub's patrons. Because, possibly off-key, public singing aside, you sound like when you're on-key, I feel like I'm on top of the world right now, and that's a good reason as any to belt out in front of these strangers. With good drinks and good friends, there's nowhere else I'd rather be tonight. And I forget for a short while. And that song was brought to you by Marianne McCull, everyone! A round of applause! My goodness, so many attractive ladies! That was so good! You rock, Marianne. Oh, please stop! <laughs> You're just saying that! You know neither of us can hold a tune, Marianne. A toast to our shameless drunk singer! May your drinks forever flow and your notes be ever lovely. Cheers. If anyone deserves a toast tonight, that's Cam. Finally sealed the deal after three years, eh? Read them and wait, bitches. Nice. Kamala's diamond engagement ring gleams as she holds it up for all the world to see. She has reasons to be proud. Three years of living together and her boyfriend finally asked her the big question. Obviously, she said yes. Don't get too attached to that ring or the one after, sweetie. I was wearing a wedding ring not so long ago, and look at where I am. Sheesh, Haruna. This is like her bachelorette party. You're gonna bring up that- Don't bring that up on this night of all nights. Good grief. But enough of me being a downer. Cheers to a happy engagement! Yeah, cheers. Of course, if something like Haruna's divorce were to happen, I'd be there for Cam. Just as Cam had been there for me, acting more than just my yoga instructor. I can't be happier for my friend right now. Cheers! Cheers! Well, we both will be there for Cam, won't we? Haruna and I? Haruna. It's been a real bad year for her ever since her divorce. She's such a nice person, even loaning me money to open a studio, and she didn't deserve what her husband had pulled. I'm happy she's smiling again and picking out like she used to. I think we've all missed our Japanese firecracker. <laughs> oh no. We met in yoga class, something I had joined to keep myself in shape, and... Well, honestly, so that I could make friends when I had moved to Luxburn. Clearly, it worked like a charm. And it definitely didn't have anything to do with the fact that I brought along my lucky D20 die with me on that first day. No, sir. <laughs> you nerd. I love these girls so much. What about you, Marianne? You're 30 years old and you still haven't got yourself a man. Barf. Don't, can we not talk about this? I'm, I just want to drink. And you guys know I have a very busy schedule. I don't have time for that. Wow, the mood immediately shifted on their faces. Oh, come on! That's a lame excuse and you know it! Were you not just going on about how men suck and, you know, getting married is pointless because you're just gonna get divorced anyway? <laughs> and now you're like, oh, come on! You should have a guy! You need a man who'll take care of you and you need it now! Maybe some hunk will be your house hubby while you rake in the dough! I'm quite capable of taking care of myself. Who needs a Mr. Right? Oh no. <laughs> or a Mrs. Right? Hey! Hey, look at me. I'm Marion McCullough, a lawful neutral cleric with nine points in wisdom and eight in charisma, but I can't get myself a date. <laughs> That's a low blow. I mentioned druids and demons once. Once! They don't even know the rules or understand what the numbers mean. And I certainly am not some sort of holy person. I am a far cry from a miracle worker, and I barely had the willpower to fight off demons. Especially my own. Actually, maybe she isn't looking for a Mr. Right, but a Mrs. Right. Or maybe both, because you can end up with either of those rights if you play your cards right. Oh, my Marianne, we still love you even if you're in the closet. That would explain some things. It would? How do you know you don't have a ring anymore? Maybe you two can be together and I don't have to worry about my best girls being alone. Oh god. What are you on about? There's nothing to explain! But the more I deny, the louder they tease until the other people in the pub start to watch. 
It doesn't help at all when Haruna drapes her arm over my shoulders and leans in. Will I be all yours then? Will you be making me feel like a woman? I know that they're just kidding around, but this doesn't make me comfortable in the slightest. So when Kamala notices my silence and Haruna sees the expression on my face, they stop. Okay, well at least they finally stopped. And when the awkward air settles over us, the rest of the pub goes back to whatever they were doing before the whole thing ever happened. They probably won't even remember it when they wake up with massive hangovers anyway. Sorry. Me too! Well, I'm glad that they resolved that quickly and didn't just let it get out of control. Hey, no hard feelings, right? I raise my glass. They smile. We drink. There's no need to say more. We're all definitely far too drunk tonight. Eventually, the fun times end. It is a weekday, after all. And with Haruna being a nurse, she still has to get ready for her next shift. Cam also has a loving fiancé waiting for her at home, and really didn't have to make a fuss about having left some buns in the oven when she took off early. Uh-huh. Really, I understand. I was the one who was insisted, who was determined to get pissed drunk anyway. Moving to the bar, I sit. Alone at last. Alone with a stranger who should not be drinking because it is pancreatitis, Luke, right? I haven't seen him here before. Obviously not a regular. He hasn't said... He hasn't said word. And just sits there savoring his drink. Okay, it's the 18th, yeah? 18th. Okay. I was wondering if he was... This is where he was when Hannah had her party. And I'm like, really? You were at a bar when your wife was holding a party at your flat. Good grief. With his whiskey served neat in one hand and lighter in the other, it doesn't seem like he's noticed me yet. And maybe I should go before he does look my way. Because he was pretty and he was blonde, and those two things plus alcohol never did me any good. A thought too late. Oh no, we're doomed. Judging by the way his flushed face and the dazed look in his eyes, he's as pissed drunk as I am. But whereas I feel like keeling over, he looks like he's still ready to take the catwalk by storm. Really, he just has the air of one of those men who think they own the world. Hello there, sexy. Please don't stand up on my account. I already like what I see. Oh no. This is before we work for them. Oh, this is so awkward. <laughs> oh no. Fancy a drink? It'll be on me. But then again, I might be pleasantly surprised if he proves me wrong. Want some between the sheets? Sex on the beach? <laughs> I'm talking cocktails, of course. You have to ask her, like, on the beach? <laughs> Fat chance. But it doesn't matter. We both know how to play this game. And... There are two different ways for the night to end. One thing or another is going to happen. The question is, what do I want to do? Oh no, that's fine. I'd rather order some blue balls or some AMF if you don't mind. Dang. He looks like he's about to say some witty retort, but stops himself and downs the rest of his whiskey. I order a mint julep, he gets another whiskey, and we start the customary small talk. Of course, the saying, ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies, goes without saying. We ask nothing about each other, offering up falsehoods to establish a strenuous fake connection between two strangers at a pub, if only to pass the time. Whiskey, as I have come to call him, is supposedly 21 years old, single, takes care of his sick mother, and is a manager of some sort. Well, I believe that he might be a manager of some sort. Manager of what? I didn't care to listen to the details. Meanwhile, Mint, as he has come to call me, is 29, and I'm... What did I say I was again? <laughs> so you knocked off one year off your age. Oh yes, I told him that I was a professional chocolate taster. Because fuck it, if I'm going to lie about what my job is, might as well make it fun. <laughs> I like this girl. That's a pretty decent chat between two pretty drunk strangers. 
And maybe it's just me, but we might as fucking well expend the tiniest amount of effort in pretending there's something meaningful in this meeting. Would've been nice too if it was just left at that. But during a lull in the conversation, he brings it up. You know, I've never been with a woman taller than me. You poor man. And to think, he might have been different from the rest. Never have and never will, Whiskey. Can we go back to the history of chocolates? Did you know that chocolate candy was introduced in 19th century England as a healthier alternative to alcohol? St. Lucy was the most beautiful woman of her time. She had men come from the four corners of the world just to see the pure light of her exquisite green eyes. If she were so lucky, anyway. No, enough of the history lesson. <laughs> Are you taking on her accent as time goes on? Come on, Mint. You know and I know what you came here for. Though not every suitor was gallant, and she was no fool. She had known that, sooner or later, she wouldn't be able to defend her chastity. Come on. There must be something that gets you going. God, I can't believe this is happening right now. So, she had taken out a knife. And gouged out her own eyes. Okay, I thought Lucy was connected to the chocolate story somehow, but apparently not. <laughs> At least I don't think so. Hmm, there is something. But I don't think you can handle it. Impressed with her devotion, God restored her eyes and made them more beautiful than before. He has a peculiar sense of humor, hasn't he? Because that only meant suitors kept going after Lucy. And she kept her eyes in a chalice to scare them away. Oh, I'm pretty sure I can handle whatever it is. Uh-huh. Saint Lucy, help me. <laughs> help me turn away from sin. Help me with my own blindness. My place isn't too far from here. Saint Lucy didn't help. I won't help. take care of you if it ends up being too much for you. Spoiler, Saint Lucy didn't help. And no one will be able to hear you if you try to scream. You sure you want to go down that road, pretty boy? Wouldn't have it any other way. I thought I was gonna get a choice in this! Marianne the color. Oh god, no, 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 this isn't how it's supposed to go. Marianne went to the Crawl Bar, also called the Galway Shawl by its patrons, for a night out with her close friends Cam and Haruna. When they left, Marianne was seen with a stranger, whom she only referred to as Whiskey. In turn, she was called Mint. Whiskey and Mint. A love written in the stars. <laughs> but not this playthrough, thank you very much. The best thing about having my condo so close to the pub is the ease of access. As long as I can still stand and walk, I can make it home. Maybe I'd need help from a kind neighbor or two to help me with the last leg if I've really gone overboard on the alcohol. But I always made it home. Sometimes with company. Of course, that always comes with complications. Especially with the real clingy ones. But it isn't anything a good tip about stalkers to the building security can't fix. I'm always nervous, though. Even if this isn't the first time I've done this. And the first few minutes when we enter my room are the first few agonizing minutes where I try not to panic. Okay, Mac. So far, so good. Maybe he won't notice a giant anime poster on the wall. Don't let him smell your fear under all that liquid courage. He'll leave sooner or later and I'll never have to see him again. Just like every other man before him. I'd like to say to myself that the men I brought to my place were more scared than I was. Yet, there is no fear when I look into Whiskey's eyes. Only delight. When he starts touching me, I don't even hesitate when I push him against the door. Roughness is to be expected. And as long as he sticks to the script, everything will go smoothly. We'll have our little tumble in the sheets, he'll leave, we'll forget about it. If somebody asked what I really wanted, I would have told them that I wanted a bed of roses, chocolate and music, Maybe in an Irish castle. <laughs> Sounds great. But all I really want is her. And that's never going to be a reality. That was my fault, of course. Because I was afraid. Because I was a coward. They would never hold a candle up to her. She was the light of my life. And I had let her go. I can't even be bothered at the thought of her. 
Just a single thought of her makes my resolve to see this affair through waver. Wait. What is it now? Yes, what is it now? What's it gonna be, Marianne? To sex or not to sex? This is when you give me the choice, not back at the bar. Here in the room now. Thanks, game. <sighs> well, I guess I should have had alcohol on hand for myself. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to do, like, positive relationships with all the characters, but... Um, you two are not getting together in this first playthrough. I'm keeping the marriage working as much as possible. I just realized, too, this means... Luke not only cheated on Hannah with Rochelle, but also Marianne. If you go through with this, unless this just happens no matter what choice you make, and he's just... Forces? I don't know. I can't see him forcing it, though, either. From Hannah's chapter, it seems like Luke respects a strong woman. He might even like the fact that she says, uh, actually, no. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not, it's not happening. Maybe next time? I'll have to look into that. Let's see what happens when we say this is wrong. We're both drunk. It went up. It went up a lot. Holy, we, we, we surpassed Hana on one choice. Does it go down if you sleep with him? I have questions. And? This is wrong. Don't you think it's a bit fucked up that we're about to have sex and we're just calling each other by the drinks that we had? How messed up are we? Major. Doll, shut up with the ethics and morality talk. It is seriously putting me out of the mood. Your bar can't lie to me, sir. If you want to leave now, whiskey, I understand. I mean, with how smashed you are, it'd probably be best for you to sleep the night unless you want to be mugged. But I won't stop you. And this isn't going to happen. Bloody hell. You're cock blocked. <laughs> it's a freaking rooster going, ah! <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Of course, he's annoyed at me for putting off our night of sexual congress. But no means no. And beyond spewing a few profanities under his breath, he surprisingly simmers down soon enough. I was worried for a moment that he might try to force something. I was. Excuse me. Instead, he makes a show of fixing his suit and smoothing down his hair before making himself comfortable on the nearest seat he could find. What are you doing then? You have a guest in your home. Put the damn kettle on. Excuse? This is my home. Don't you bark orders at me, sir. Dandelion tea if you have it. But I suppose all you have are those shitty tea bags from the store. Dandelion tea, wow. If it isn't for the absurdity of this turn of events, I would have flipped him off for thinking I have no taste. But in the end, I just laughed. All I got are cans of Korean ginseng and lemon balm, though. No dandelion. Without a second thought, I do wet the tea. That's three minutes to get the kettle to a boil. Three minutes where we say nothing to each other. I mean, what do you even say to the guy I was going to sleep with until I changed my mind? I doubt he's in the mood to talk about the influence of Troy's on Mallory. Probably not. It's still unusual by the time we're both seated on my bed with mugs of tea in hand. Just so you know, whatever is going on right now is a lot stranger and fucked up than the one night stand. I agree. This is very strange, but also somehow wholesome-ish? We are two messed up individuals by your logic. Everything is messed up, if you ask me. War? Terrorism? Famine? Poverty? Loved ones and loved lost? Oh! Oh! This whole world is a cesspool. Sure. The dead air is telling when it fills the room once more. One would think that this is the perfect time to burst, to spill about whatever issues that made us the fucked up person that we are today. And it is. 
But I guess some part of me would rather not put the weight of my problems on somebody else's shoulder. It wouldn't be fair to leave that to a person when I don't even know if we'll ever see each other again. Sooner rather than later, we both pass out on my bed, mugs left forgotten on the floor. At, this was not how I was expecting this chapter to begin. When I wake, whiskey is already gone. Thanks for the tea, Marianne. Crap, he found out my name. Oh no. A bottle of painkillers and a note on the table are the only evidence that I wasn't alone last night. So he didn't leave his name. Bastard. I don't even question where these are from or just how he knew my real name. I'm just grateful for something to help with the hangover. Might as well. Marianne and Whiskey went back to her condo after having one too many drinks. However, Marianne changed her mind about the one-night stand and ended up sharing tea with him instead. The next morning, the stranger left nothing but a note and a bottle of painkillers. I have a job to do. Alright, now it's Saturday. Wow. It isn't often that I think about drinking on the job. But after meeting with the rights yesterday, really makes me want to break my self-imposed rules. Ooh. So, Mrs. Wright looks like an old love of hers, first of all. And then she almost slept <laughs> with the husband. Poor Marianne. Because first off, fucking damn whiskey was fucking damn Mr. Wright. And to top it all off... They had somehow forgotten to inform me that they didn't own the Ermengarde mansion yet when they hired me. What what sort of person does that? Ugh, rich people. Barf. I could do nothing but twiddle my thumbs at this, however. Twiddle my thumbs and wait for the go signal. It's not like I can accept other smaller projects. This is a big job and I should be ready to start on it at any time. Not to mention that my PA practically begged me to be patient and wait this out. It was a hard decision to agree, but I did so in the end. Besides, I'm doing this for the Ermengarde Mansion, not for anything or anyone else. I'd have a headache whatever I do anyway. I'd go to the pub again, but seeing what happened a few days ago, I'd rather not end up in bed with another potential client. And it might be a huge leap in logic, but a library is the next best thing after the pub. I have to go there anyway. I need more books for dad. Plus, I also need to return the ones I borrowed last time. Finding a new book or two to read for myself while I have nothing to do isn't such a bad idea either. So, on a Saturday morning, I find myself going to the only library in Luxburn to hopefully cool off. Ah, okay. After returning an Urzuli and a poetry book by Henry of Podebrady, I ask the librarian about the several titles on my list, though I don't have much luck on that front. Dialogue with death has already been snatched, and she bluntly said that she did not keep our mathematical universe for someone who didn't return books on time. Rude. <clears throat> I make headway, at least, when I ask about Siege and Rendition of Havana by Jacobo de Pezuela. If you count her snarling and pointing at the history section as headway, that is. The history section is devoid of any other except for myself and a redhead, though I'd wager a guess that Red's just passing by to get to the classical literature section. So many books, so little time. Scanning the books and seeing so many wonderful titles gives me great pleasure. And that's when I spot it. Hello, sailor. Why don't you come to Mama? It's not the naval battle book I was looking for, no. It's even better. <laughs> so my sailor comment really makes even less sense. The newly acquired history of Luxburn architecture. First edition, too. I know I just have to get it. I've been waiting to get my hands on the book for so long. The fact that there is only one copy proves to be a problem, though, when Red reaches out for it at the same time as I do. I think I had this first, miss. Oh, you're Red. Hello, Becca. I can only stare her down when she refuses to let go of the book. Refusing to let go of it as well, I raise a brow at her in the hopes that the fact that I was significantly taller than her would intimidate the girl. Even then, she refused with a rebellious look. This isn't exactly light reading, miss. Oh dear. 
Irish woman and a Scots woman going at it in the library. I mean, do you even know which architect was at the forefront of 18th century Irish architecture? A beat. She blinks and I can't help the smirk on my face. Which is wiped off when she opens her mouth. Edward Lovett Pierce who established the Palladian style through his work with Castletown House and the Irish Houses of Parliament. Dang. Took me to school. This bridge was destroyed in this year to delay French troops while under the regency of Mary of Guise. This is not what I was expecting. Let's be honest. How many people would know these history facts? Aside from me, anyway. Going right to the obscure ones, aren't you? <laughs> Shock. Easy enough. Tullybody Old Bridge in Clackmannanshire, Scotland, on the January of 1560, if we want to be specific. Pop quiz. Suddenly, it's a game where we throw these history questions and facts at each other, back and forth in the hushed tones unless we want to be thrown out of the library. After a while, it goes from some strange competition into this strange but friendly banter, if it could be called that. But as fun as it is, the exchange soon slows down until we're grinning at how odd this whole scene is. Marianne McCulloch, my desire for potatoes doesn't quite match what the stereotypes suggest. Nice. Rebecca Gales, the Scots' supposed hatred for the English wasn't enough to stop me from teaching their little spawns. <laughs> <laughs> this is a friendship I didn't know I needed. By then, we had forgotten about our little tug of war, although she still holds the book in her hands. I had let go of it without realizing when she answered my first question. History teacher, then? Got it in one. Nice. No wonder you gave me a run for my money. Now, if we're talking about architecture, I'd blow you out of the water. You're from where? Luxburn Uni? Oh, no. Just St. Goretti's. Ah, uh, yeah, St. Goretti. you think a school would choose a more appropriate saint to name themselves after, especially when they have very young students. And I'm guessing you're an architect. If you're so confident about the subject. Interior designer, Miss Gales. Please, just call me Rebecca. You aren't one of my students, are you? Marianne, then. I could have said that I was an architect, but there's no point in explaining why I wasn't one anymore. So, I've never seen you before. I'd like to think I've met every history aficionado in town. I blame the rock I've been hiding under, of course. <laughs> that, and I'm usually only here on the weekdays if time allows. Work often has me meeting clients on the weekends. Hmm, that must be interesting work. It allows for some creative freedom, sure. But it's like working with children sometimes. Though you probably have it harder working with actual children. The hardest part is convincing them that your idea is their idea. That sounds exciting. <laughs> it is! But isn't that true for any workplace, though? We just cross our fingers and hope there aren't any man-children in charge of important things. Any big projects right now? I can't imagine that interior designing is a frequent thing. I'm working on the Ermengarde Mansion. Lucky me. <laughs> that mansion. Intach. Wonderful. Breathtaking. I can't wait to start in it. Now that is beautiful architecture. A pause. Uh, what date is it? It's a new day. It's not the 18th anymore. So I'm wondering if... Becca's seen the letter yet. Uh, maybe? I need to pay more attention to the dates going by. It looks like she wants to say something at my mention of the house. I'm not surprised. That place is certainly popular with the locals, especially with the urban legends attached to it. In the next second, though, she seems to think better of it and drops what she's about to say. So, do you have a portfolio or anything I can take a look at? I'd love to see your designs. Maybe you have some on a tablet? I've met some designers before, and they're always going crazy over these virtual room apps or another. A tablet? <laughs> Please. Calocrates didn't need those silly eye tabs when he <laughs> built the Parthenon. I certainly don't need one to design a house. Oh my goodness, I love this girl. <laughs> I don't trust those eye tabs. Give me a piece of paper and a pencil. I'll draw it out. The computer back at my place is all I have. Why should I buy such an expensive gadget that will just get outdated within the year when what I have is just as functional? 
The traditional ways had a far more personal touch, in my opinion. Not to mention, those smartphones are awful tools of procrastination. I can't even count on one hand the number of people I see going outside only to have their eyes glued to the things. And fuck touchscreens. They're evil things that make typing, what should have been a simple task, harder. I do have an online portfolio, if you'd like. I can... Speaking, or thinking of the devil, seems to have summoned it. Because before I can even carry on, Rebecca's attention wanes as she pulls out her mobile. <laughs> That's a cute phone. For what I can only assume is a call, she gives me an apologetic look before she's standing up and excusing herself. Off farther into the aisle she goes for some privacy. I do my best to give it to her as well, trying to tune her out. Belle, is something wrong? Hmm. Lunch at the coffee house. Uh, sure. I can make it. I'm not too far. I can be there in ten. Okay. So Belle's calling her to celebrate selling of the house. But with how quiet the surrounding is, she can't blame me if I overhear snippets of her conversation. When she returns with a sheepish look on her face, I know that our friendly chat has to be cut short. <sighs> Sorry. I have to go and meet with some friends. It's fine. Totally fine. No need to even apologize. About the book. Her embarrassment increases twofold when she realizes she's still holding on to history of Luxburn architecture. I don't give her time to think about it as I put a hand up and shake my head. Fishing out a pen and paper from my bag along with one of my business cards, I hand them over to her. You know, I'm busy with work, so I might not even be able to take a peek at it any time soon. You can go ahead and have it. But you'll have to ring me up when you're returning it, just so I can snag it right away. Deal? Nice. She makes quick work, penning her number down and handing it back to me with a grin. Deal. Just message me during school hours, of course. I like that she didn't take her phone out and have her put her number in. She took out a, a pad of paper and a pen, which is something I would do. <laughs> oh, I like this girl. You have a good day, then. You too. With Rebecca gone, I'm left alone standing in the history section. Although my original plans were simply to sit down and read a good book, our little pop quiz, if you could call it that, made the time pass by without any of us even realizing it. It was fun, and I do believe I made a new friend. Good job, Marianne! Even with the talk of lunch, however, I don't feel like grabbing a bite to eat. There are still other books to be read here, and I'm hoping to find something that will help me while I work with the rights. Something like How to Deal with Arseholes Professionally 101, just in case. I've dealt with a lot of uppity, snooty, and rich clients before, but it's still better to be safe than sorry. Because Luke Wright just takes the fucking cake. And he probably manages to eat it, too. It seems the world is conspiring to keep me from my me time, as my mobile vibrates in my pockets the moment I find something from the shelves of the classic literature section. Marianne McCulloch, Charlie Rose Design speaking. Miss Cooper. Oh yeah, you're still alive. Rose Cooper here, Miss McCulloch. I hope I didn't catch you at a bad time or anything, but I just wanted to check in and tell you that we've got the clear to hand over the documents. Madam Wright told us that we should forward the floor plans to you. Already? How did they go through the process so fast? Surely there is so many red tape to even acquire the forms and the transferring of rights. No matter how rich the rights are, it shouldn't be this quick, right? So, if I can just have your email, I'll be sending them your way. I'd actually like a physical copy of the floor plans. Oh, I, I suppose that's fine. I'm not at the office right now, but I can inform Miss Santos of your request. I'll make sure to drop by the office after lunch, if that's fine. Not a problem. Right. Well, cheers. Right. Cheers. I don't know. I just don't. Is there some sort of deeper miscommunication when we last met? These things take time. It's been, what, a day? Less than that, even. There isn't even a point in trying to make sense of these people who seem to be larger than life. All right. 22nd. Aww, that's so cute! Marianne befriended Rebecca Gales during a visit to the library. Marianne received a call from Rose Cooper afterwards, informing her that the Ermengarde Mansion's floor plans were ready for pickup at their office. Um, okay, so they bought it. That should actually be before. 
the meeting with Rebecca. That's okay. And then she saw the ghost in the crowd. Okay. As it looks like I'm on the clock starting today, I might as well eat. Grabbing some fish and chips from one of the street food stalls, I find a table to spend time with a copy of Marquis de Sade's The Crime of Love, since Rebecca left with the book I wanted. I've read this one before, along with the rest of his works. This would be the 18th time, in fact. But it's always nice to read through it again when I don't have the time to enjoy something new. Besides, when you're dealing with people so filthy rich that they just end up plain filthy, you need the good old Marquis sound advice. La blessure se trouvant sans aucune sorte de conséquence. Oui. Ah, the wound being without any consequence. Of course, it's folly to think that things have no consequence when everything actually does. Briar Realty Corporation's Luxburn branch isn't too far off from the city center. Just a few blocks away and I can easily eat and walk. I'd rather use this time to rest before I go into a flurry of activity. No doubt there'll be so much to do once we get hands-on with the mansion. Still a lot better than working on another condo, at least. Surely, no matter how much BRC and the old owners put into the restoration and preservation of the place, any big repairs would be superficial at most. I am quite certain that, in their haste to sell the property, they did a rush job. It isn't an infrequent thing to do, despite how it is frowned upon. There will be a lot of hidden issues that I will need to weed out, and I have to make sure I find every single one of them, especially the more serious damages. Structural integrity is definitely on top of the list we will have to consider. The building might look sturdy, but it is centuries old. That alone will likely pose a few problems here and there, put limitations on what we can do. Besides, despite how much I detest these rich snobs, they can pay rather handsomely, so long as I do an excellent job and do more than necessary. Those two things always made sure the referrals keep coming. I don't even have to hunt down projects for myself. When I do go up to BRC's office, I can't help but stop and stare when I enter the building. With the lunch hour closing, employees should have been back already, if they still aren't filtering through the doors. I get that it's a Saturday, that people probably feel tired and lazy to be working on a weekend. But they're still on the clock, and not bumming about wasting company time on extended lunch breaks and cigarette sessions. The office is spacious, as it is with these big corporations. Each person is given their little space of what's usually a 2 by 2 meter cubicle. There is a lot more empty chairs than there are actual people working at their desks. It reminds me far too much of my last day at Por Porskova Projects during the massive layoffs due to the Irish economic crisis. But it isn't just that, though. Everything is as quiet as a grave. It's as if these people are merely ghosts. Well, she saw a ghost lady not that long ago. Speaking of ghosts, Santos comes in through the door looking as if she's just seen one. She literally did. She looks at me, wide-eyed like a deer caught in the headlights, ready to bolt at any moment. I'd ask, out of concern, but I feel it's not my position to do so. What if it's something personal? I'd simply be overstepping my boundaries. Really, it's none of my business. I presume that Miss Cooper told you why I'm here, Miss Santos. Huh? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, I just got back from lunch, you know? But it won't take too long. Don't worry. Of course it won't. This whole project has established itself to be a matter done in haste. And I'm not happy about it. I do hope it doesn't mean that people are being careless in their duties. She flinches and looks like she doesn't quite know how to respond to that. I mean, from the other side of the table, it seems like you're insinuating she's done something. <laughs> Not above board, so how would you respond to that? Thankfully, instead of opening her mouth, she leads the way towards her station and goes to fetch the floor plans. It won't take too long, as she said, but it does take a bit. Time spent to compose herself, most likely. You know, we usually just email these things. I prefer the real thing. Not that you would know. Dang. You probably have your nose stuck in front of a smartphone when you're not working, and even when you should be working, playing those mindless, addictive games. Marianne, you play video games. Don't be a snob to mobile gamers. I definitely wish Chris would stop playing that bat cat thingy during work hours, too. 
<laughs> Bat Cat is even a video game franchise? I don't care if it's mobile based. Good grief, Bat Cat. Taking over the world. I know what you mean. Digital painting is nice, but nothing beats the smell of real paint. Not that I go and smell paint like a crazy person, but, <laughs> you know, the real thing is different. Good job, Belle. Wait, what? Yes, nothing is quite like the real thing. Oh. Lousy lucky. Okay, so there's two attics. Um, where's the, so this is the, this is the ground floor. So there's the porch, foyer, to the right is the parlor. And there's the, the bathrooms are off the parlor, okay. And then there's a music room. And then it doesn't go over there, so you go out here. There's a hall to the basement. This is the main ballroom, goes out to the garden. There's a hall and quarters, I guess, for servants. The gallery, dining hall, and the kitchen's off the, and then there's a wine cellar, okay. And then when you go up the stairs, there's like two balconies. To the right is a hallway. There's a theater off the hallway. Okay, this is bedroom, study room, balcony. Okay. And stairs to attic. Okay, so I'm trying to like picture when we go in my mind. Isn't the stairs to the attic always been on this side of the hallway? Oh, we must be... Okay, this is the windows on the left. And then... Okay, so it's this... It's this attic that's cursed. Okay. It seems so wide here. The hallway looks a lot thinner. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, the hallways look so... Why do they look so giant? That's that's really weird. Okay, everything else looks fine, I think, but the hallways are weird. Checking out the floor plans, I see that I'll have a lot going for me. Now I know how Ray felt when he found the Central Park West building floor plans from that one movie. This is why I became an architect in the first place. Jacobean style at its finest. It's a thing of beauty. Look at these gorgeous rooms, the delicate harmony between empty spaces. And speaking of empty spaces, there's something rather odd about these ones. I feel a bit silly saying it out loud because I've never lived in a big house, let alone a mansion. But during the tour, I had the distinct impression that the rooms were... bigger. Hmm. So you had the opposite problem. I'm like, these seem giant. Let's see. Dining? They do... You're right, though. Like, this does seem smaller. I haven't seen the parlor, I don't think. Master's bedroom is huge. I don't know. It's weird. There is something funky going on. Maybe the scale is wrong? Yeah. It's not much of a problem. And it is an old house. Ghost floor plans? There had been little details here and there that I would have liked to address during the open house, too. But it was all forgotten in the wake of Miss Santis's incident and the trouble with ownership. The wine cellar is going to be a problem. I shuddered to think what sort of repairs they did to the place. There might have been things that were swept under the rug, pushed to the dark corner of the rooms and hidden away in barrels. Water damage could have been covered up. There had been floods due to heavy rains in West England just last year, after all. And if there's any sort of damage to the house's foundation, that's going to be a lot of work. I was not able to look at the attic as well. For all I know, a whole family of vermin could have made their nests there. Working with pest control is always the worst. I can tell you, the stairs here need to be fixed. Lights need to be put in. Uh, it needs to be dusted and swept and um, exhumed and blessed and all kinds of stuff. The sheer size of this place is staggering, even if I did just say it was a lot smaller than I thought. I might just be biting off more than I can chew, but who doesn't like a good challenge? First things first, I'll have to- So, do you want a coffee? The one from the staff room is pretty decent. <laughs> Poor Isabella, she's like, um, 
Do you want to have a seat or something? There's really no need. I'm sure you have rules against it. Rules against bringing someone coffee? That's ridiculous. And even if there were regulations against it, nobody's really here to tell Sir John. I've already brought two mugs, and I'm not going to drink them on my own. <laughs> Come on. I have to stamp down my annoyance at being distracted. Seeing the girl, the young woman, though, it looks like she has a lot on her mind. If babbling is her way of dealing with stray thoughts, I'm not really the one she should be babbling to. How should I respond? Oh, come on, man, we're friends. If our bar is of any indication. Don't be, li don't be like that. Whoa! All right, we're smooching Isabella. <laughs> Confirmed. Because, uh, Ash? Ash has a lot of work to do, so I think Ash might have missed this chance. I give her time to speak up. But when she just stares, I clear my throat. Yes? You have something to say? As embarrassment creeps up on her face, I snatch one of the coffees from her and take a sip. Too hot. Just thinking and speaking off the record. It must be fun what you do. You go to people's houses and you make them, well, pretty. You're sharing your art with them. It's a little bit more complex than that. But if you put it that way, it is fun. I wouldn't have done it for seven years if it wasn't a little bit fun, I guess. These big clients always have paintings in their homes. Do you have a supplier for art pieces? I didn't expect to hear such a question from her, seeing how well she handled herself yesterday. I didn't doubt then why she was assigned to an important sale like the Ermengarde Mansion, despite the little accident she had. Now, she just looks too young, too nervous, and unsure of herself. Although, her enthusiasm must make up for that in spades. In fact, I wouldn't have believed it if she had introduced herself the way she is at the moment. Why, watching her now, she actually looks like she should still be in college. Acts a bit like it too when I think about it. I thought she was a teen slumming it out in the mansion when I first saw her there lying on the ground. Surprise, surprise, she turned out to be one of the estate agents handling the property. But clients usually support artists of their own choice. If they don't, I'm always happy to refer those that I know. That's cool. They're very picky. I don't think a hobbyist will have an easy time getting their work sold. Hey, I'll have you know I was a student of the fine arts. Excuse you. And yet here you are selling property. Maybe you weren't a very fine student of the arts. Ow! Marianne, we're friends. Why? Maybe I took that a bit too far. She bites her cheek, and it looks like she's barely holding herself back. It's not like I had a choice. She mutters it under her breath. I barely even hear it. But the hurt is there. And it makes one wonder what brought it on. Although it is understandable, if her reason's what I think it is. Very few people make it big in the art world. I can see why she'd be upset about it with that enthusiasm. I didn't have a choice when I left Ireland. It was that or years of unemployment. The recession and the toll it took in the construction industry was out of anyone's control. I don't know what choice she wasn't able to make, whether it was about her being at art school or something else. But the world isn't a fair place. And the sooner she accepts it, the better. What are all these story updates? Still, with that forlorn look on her face, I can't help but sigh. The girl reminds me far too much of myself when I was younger. Well, if you're thinking of commissioning your paintings, I'll have to see your work first. Oh, it's not... I didn't mean it like that. I don't have any paintings. Really? You sounded a lot like you still did art or want to. Yeah, what brought that on, I wonder? Now I'm starting to worry that you might just like the smell of paint. <laughs> nice. I'm not a paint huffer, sheesh! I don't know. I think you might have added yourself. I just mean I don't make much anymore. I don't really have the time for it. The tools and materials aren't exactly cheap either. Everything has a price. It sounds like you're making excuses for something you're presumably passionate about. If you really want to practice art, a little out of your wallet isn't much. It's true. It's not that simple. You just sold a million dollar, multi-million dollar mansion. Multi-million pound mansion, girl. I think you can afford some art supplies. It's not. Life's simple. People just like to make it complex. Speaking off the record, I have some advice for you, kid. 
Grow up, kid. Oh, boy. Either go for what you want or stop thinking about it when you have something else. Dang. That is unless you enjoy making yourself miserable. Then by all means. You know, Marianne, you come out with some good advice, but you should really follow it yourself. <laughs> it sounds great. You should also do this. You know, if you wanted to look at the floor plans without me bothering you, you could have just said so. Would you have left me alone? This is such an aggro conversation, considering how close these two are, uh, supposedly. We'll never know now, will we? <clears throat> well, that went well. <laughs> ah. Marianne visited BRC to pick up the floor plans. She was assisted by Isabella Santos, and the two shared a brief talk about art, which ended with Marianne leaving a piece of advice to Isabella. Let me give you a pizza advice. A strained air settles in the room afterwards. It doesn't help that she doesn't immediately leave, as she has said, lingering awkwardly by the door with that downcast expression. It's clear there's more she means to say, perhaps even to defend herself and her choices in life. Or is she expecting me to dish out more of that advice? It's an awkward affair, and I choose to hightail out of the realty office as quickly as I can. <laughs> 